I am Virgil Adams. I am an attorney here in Macon with the law firm of Adams, Jordan, and Harrington. And I am pleased to be here today uh, on behalf of uh, my law firm and, and uh, here to address the Family Conference 2020 at Beulah Land Bible Church. I'm very much appreciative of, of this invitation, and uh, I appreciate uh, Pastor Kelly inviting me to be out, and I appreciate the, the congregation. I want to take some time today and talk to you about uh, just some common sense things that I think we ought to know and things that, that will help you uh, in your daily lives as I see issues come up from a legal perspective. And what we're going to talk about today, basically, is getting your legal house in order. Things you need to know and do now. Getting your legal house in order, things you need to know and do now. And again, I want to talk about practical experiences, practical, practical issues that you experience every day. We're going to talk about estates and guardianships. We're going to talk about uh, powers of attorney, general powers of attorney durable power of attorney uh, for uh, finances. We're going to talk about advanced directives for health care. We'll talk about wills. And then finally, we're going to talk about uh, automobile issues and issues with insurance policies and what to do if you're involved in an accident. Because I see so many issues uh, with people uh, who are involved in accidents and they either don't really understand what insurance they have and don't really know what to do. And since we do a lot of personal injury cases, I thought it would be timely to address that subject uh, uh, as well. But let's talk about, uh, when, we, when we talk about estates and guardianships, let's talk about terms to remember. These are words that you have heard that you may or may not know what they mean, but I think they're important just to provide you with some, some reference points. So we're going to talk about, first of all, terms to remember with respect to estates and guardianship. You all have probably heard the word administrator. The administrator is a person appointed by the probate court to handle a person's estate when there is no will. So it, when a person dies without a will, the person appointed by the probate court to be responsible for disposing of that person's property is the administrator. You may have heard the word codicil. A codicil is simply a fancy way of saying a change to your will. Conservator, that's a person who's appointed by the probate court to manage the property or money of a minor or an in incapacitated adult. There's a durable power of attorney. That's a, a document that you can give a person to act on your behalf to do everything that you can do and it survives even if the person who's given the power of attorney becomes incompetent. Then there's the word estate. Well, what is an estate? An estate is what you leave behind when you die, your assets and your debts, everything you own and everything you owe. Executor or executrix, that's the, 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 the same uh, uh, term really as the administrator. You remember I said the administrator is the person in charge of your estate when you don't have a will. Well, the executor or executrix is the person in charge of your estate when you do have a will. General power of attorney, that's another document, another power of attorney that you can give someone, but it only lasts until you die or you become incompetent. Not like the durable power of attorney that lasts even if you become incompetent. Then there's a guardian. That's a person appointed by the probate court to manage the affairs of a minor or an inca incapacitated adult. I'm sure you've heard the word heir or heirs. An heir is just a surviving relative who receives your property when you die. That would be the person, your relative, that's entitled to your property after you die. Intestate, not interstate like 75, but intestate, that's when you die without a will. Letters of administration, these are documents that are issued by the probate court when there is no will. The 
counter to that, it's what we call letters testamentary. That's a document issued by the probate court when there is a will. Then we have a what we call a self-proven will. That's where you, you do your will and you have two witnesses who sign an affidavit that says you were competent, you are who you said you were, and everything in the will was done appropriately. That way, when it comes time to probate your will, you don't have to go and look up those witnesses. The affidavit will take care of that. And then the word testate, that's the counter to intestate. Intestate meaning you don't have a will. Testate means you have a will. So those are some terms that uh, I hope you can remember. When you hear them, you know what they mean. Now, we'll talk about, you know, assets that are included in your estate when you pass. As I said earlier, that means everything that you own. If you own a house, if you own land, that's what we call real property, but also personal property, furniture, jewelry, a car, bank account, all of those things are part of your estate when you pass. Now, guardianship, either a person or an entity, for example, the, the trust department of a bank, can be appointed by a probate court as a guardian, and that is to make decisions on behalf of another person. And the person on whose behalf you will be making those decisions is called a ward. An award would either be a minor or an incapacitated adult. And in order to be appointed a guardian, the probate court must be shown that the person who you are seeking guardianship for is incompetent or incapable of being able to make decisions for themselves. Obviously, that would include a minor. But it would also include an incapacitated adult. And obviously, you see that a lot of times with with the elderly. But in order to be appointed the guardian of an elderly person who you believe is incompetent to make decisions for themselves or to take care of themselves, you have to prove that to the probate court. And the way you do that is having a signed statement, sworn document, an affidavit from a doctor, that person's doctor that basically says they are incompetent, not able to care for themselves, and in need of a guardian. Then you have conservatorship. That's a person uh, who goes to the, co the, the conservator is a person who goes to the probate court to be appointed to handle the uh, financial matters and the property of an incapacitated adult or a minor. And typically, you do the guardianship and the conservator at the same time so that you'll have a person who can make decisions for the incompetent adult, incapacitated adult, or, or minor and also the person who will be able to manage their financial affairs and handle their property. And again, you see this a lot of times with elderly, and it's really, really important these days because uh, I'm sure we've all gotten those robocalls from scammers with all kind of deals and people saying, I'm with the IRS, give me your Social Security number and all that. So when you have, you, when you have a loved one that's facing those kind of issues, you certainly need to be thinking about going to probate court and being appointed their guardian and uh, or their conservator so that you can make those decisions and handle the property for them. Now, you're talking about uh, a power of attorney. What is a financial power of attorney? That is simply a document that gives one or more persons the authority to handle your, your financial matters, to, to, to deal with your bank, to make transactions with your bank, to handle investments, all of those things, you will be given the, the person the power to do that. That is not the power to make any medical decisions for you. We'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes, but a power of attorney does not give a person the ability to make medical decisions for you, but it's just to handle your, your financial affairs or other limited affairs that you want them to handle. Now, when you when you give a power of attorney, do you give all of your powers away? No. You give only what you want to give away. You can limit it any way you want to. And once you give a power of attorney, you might ask, well, how do I revoke it? If I want to say, I don't want you to have a power of attorney anymore, how do you revoke that? You do that by simply 
putting in writing that I hereby, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, I hereby revoke the power of attorney I gave to so-and-so, so-and-so on whatever day. And when you do that, you give a copy to the person who you gave the power of attorney to, but you also give a copy to the people or the, the uh, entities that they've been dealing with. For example, your bank. If you've given someone power of attorney to handle your bank accounts, let's say if you were, you were sick or in the hospital or whatever, then once you are back up to speed, you want to revoke that power of attorney, you need to give it to the, to the person called your agent that you allow to act for you, but also give it to the bank because um, unless the bank or financial institution that they've been dealing with gets a copy of that revocation of your power of, of attorney, they can keep dealing with it. And of course, if you revoke your power of attorney but the person keeps acting on your behalf like they still have it, you need to seek the services of an attorney so that you can uh, get that uh, ceased. Now, when does the authority of the agent that you've given power of attorney to end? It can end when you specify in the power of attorney that it should end. It can end if there is a conservator appointed uh, for your property by the probate court. And it also uh, could end upon your death or upon the, unless it's a, uh, a, a, a durable power of attorney, it could last past then. If the agent, the person to whom you've given the power of attorney to dies, it will terminate then. Now, let's talk about the advance directive for health care. That's the document that deals with medical decisions. Anyone who's recently been to the hospital, you may have heard the term advance directive for health care. You know, it used to be several years ago, I, I don't think they ask you as much now, but they used to ask you, anytime you go to the hospital, do you have a living will? And now they ask you, do you have an advance directive for health care? Well, a living will was just a document that determined your wishes your, uh, regarding your right to die. Do you want to be put on life support? Do you want to have nutrition provided uh, for you if, you know, you otherwise did not have, you know, any, any cognitive function? You know, do you want to be kept on life support? Do you want to be uh, provided sustenance or do you, uh, you know, want to not have that happen and, and die? Well, the advanced directive for health care in 2007 in Georgia basically took the place of the living will and also it took the place of what we used to call a durable power of attorney for health care. So now you have the advanced directive for health care. And what does it do? There are really three parts to it. The first part of the advanced directive for health care really deals with allowing the agent, the person that you have appointed, to make the medical decisions on your behalf. You give your family member, your best friend, whomever, the power to make that decision on whether or not you, you're kept on life support, you're provided sustenance or not. Then part two of that advanced directive for health care allows you to make a choice on what you would like. You don't have to put that in the document, but it provides an opportunity for you to say what you want done. And then point, part three allows someone to be nominated uh, to serve as your guardian if the court determines that you need a guardian. It can be revoked at any time, whether you're competent or not. And it remains effective even if a guardian is appointed unless a probate court determines otherwise. But however, here's some other instances you need to know about regarding the termination of an advanced directive for health care. If you've given an advanced directive for health care, let's say you appointed uh, your mother or brother uh, as the agent to make that decision, but you get married. When you get married, that advanced directive for health care appointing your mother or your brother is automatically revoked, and your spouse becomes the person who can make that uh, decision. So it's revoked 
as to anyone other than your spouse. If you are married and your spouse uh, has that uh, power to make that decision, but you get divorced, it is terminated, uh, and your spouse would no longer be designated as the person to make the decision with respect to uh, your, your medical care uh, being kept on life support or provided sustenance. Now, what should you do with the advanced director for health care once you get one done? And, and let me say this, too. Uh, there's a form. You, you can look up advanced director for health care under, under, on the Internet, Georgia law, and it'll give you a form for that. But I really would suggest that you get an attorney to provide one of these for you. Now, once you have one, you should keep a copy. Don't hide it from anyone where when it comes time to find it, no one can, no one can find it. Put it in a place, a safe place, where people can, can locate it, but also give a copy of it to the person that you've designated to make the decision. Uh, you need to review it periodically to make sure that your decision is the same and the person you want is that you chose is still the person that you like to have. So it's important to keep it in a safe place and to review it. Now, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about transfers of property. Transfers of property. And first with that, we're going to talk about a will. We've all, we've, we've all heard uh, about wills, and we all basically know that a will is a statement, a written statement of your intentions for your property when you die. In other words, where do I want what I own when I die to go? Who do I want it to go to? Now, we're going to first talk about intestate, that word I mentioned other, a, a, few early, a, a few minutes earlier when I said it means when you die without a will, intestate. When you are uh, intestate, when you die and you don't have a will, I like to say that you kind of do because what will happen is the state of Georgia will write a will for you. And here's what I mean by that. If you don't have a will that specifies what you want done when you die with respect to your property, then the law of the state of Georgia with respect to wills and estates will kick in. And it determines what happens. And the first priority will be to your spouse if you are married. Your property will go to your spouse, but there's a huge but there. Your spouse could be treated like a child. And what I mean by that is they could be subject to only receiving one third of your property. You may want them to have 50 percent or all of it, but if it's not specified in a will, they could wind up with only one third. After your spouse, the next heir that's entitled to your property would be your children. If you don't have a spouse and you don't have any children, then your next heirs will be your parents, assuming they're still living. If you don't have a spouse, no kids, no surviving parents, but you got brothers and or sisters, they become your heirs. They are next in line. If you don't have any of those, no brothers, no sisters, no parents, no kids, no spouse, then it goes to nieces and nephews, then to great nieces and nephews. If none of those, but you have grandparents, grandparents become your heirs. If you don't have grandparents and none of the others that I mentioned, then if you've got cousins, it goes to your cousins, but it stops at first cousins. If you've got second, third, fourth, fifth cousins, doesn't matter. They are not your heirs, and they will not receive any of your property when you die. Now, when you're intestate, when you don't have a will, the court appoints a guardian and a conservator for minor children. So let's say you do have children. You may, want some, you may have someone in mind to be the guardian or conservator for your children, but you don't get to make that decision. The probate court here in Bibb County will make that decision. It may not be who you want. That person would also have certain duties that they wouldn't otherwise have had if you had put and named them in a will. They have to file annual reports on all of the money that they spent uh, for, your, for your children. 
Any investments must be conservative and approved by the court. They must have a surety bond. That means they go out and have to go out and buy what is in effect insurance to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. They have to have the court's permission before they can transfer any property. Now, I know a lot of us probably don't have wills. I do, but a lot of people probably don't. But I hear some of the reasons why people don't make wills, and let me just give you some of them. I'm too busy living. I have too little property. And that's a big one. You know, I don't have much, so I don't need a will. But let me tell you, the two of the biggest fights I've ever seen take place when people get either divorced and they're fighting over stuff like TVs and dishes and furniture or someone dies and they're still fighting over TVs and furnaces and cars. So you may have one car or you just may have a living room suit. But guess what? If you don't have a will and you got heirs, they may very well be fighting over who gets that, li that living room suit if you don't have a will. I've heard that it's too expensive. I can write one myself. Yeah, I can get a form online. And I always say, he who represents himself has a fool for a client. So you need to get a lawyer who's experienced to, to handle a will. And, and it just depends on how much property you got and how involved you want it to be with respect to how much it would cost. But it's money well spent. And then I've heard, well, I don't plan to die anytime soon. Well, we know how that works. We know how that works. So the disadvantages of not having a will, there still has to be an orderly distribution of your property, and it may not be in accordance with what you want. It's determined by Georgia law, and you put a lot of responsibility and decision-making on behalf of the probate court without regard to what your wishes might have been. And, for example, and I think this is really appropriate, you know, you may, you may want to leave money to your church or your favorite charity when you die. If you don't have a will saying that, that does not happen. You have no control over that. So the advantages of having a will is you spe or one, you specify where you want your property to go. You nominate who you want to be the guardian or conservator of your children. You specify who you want to be the executor in charge of your estate. You can create trust. You can, you can set up the distribution however you want to. For example, if you've got wife and kids and your kids are, let's say, 10 years old, 12 years old, and you want to have something for them when they turn 18 and they otherwise, you know, start to get their life established. Well, you can, you're, you can create a trust in your will that says, I leave $20,000 to my two children uh, each. They should get half on their 18th birthday, the other half when they get 25, whatever. You know, and by the time they turn 18 or 25, that 20000 would have grown to a lot more money. So it's not like you just give them the money and, and, uh, and, and they can just have it whenever they want to. But if you want to spread it out so that they'll have it as they continue to grow and start to experience, you know, debt and that sort of thing, you can, you can set that up. And you can, of course, leave money to your favorite church, to your church or your favorite uh, charity. And here's something that, 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 that I would like to read to you, I think, that sort of uh, sums up what happens if you don't have a will. And this is called the statutory will of John Doe. It says, I, John Doe, make this my will by failing to have a will of my own choice prepared by my attorney. One, I have three children. Therefore, I give two-thirds of all my property both personal and real estate, to my children, and the remaining one-third to my wife. Two, I appoint my wife as guardian and conservator of my children, if she survives me. But as a safeguard, I require that, A, my wife make written account every year to probate court explaining how and why she spent money necessary for the proper care of our children. B, my wife filed a performance bond with surety 
to be approved by the probate court to guarantee she will properly handle our children's money. See, when our children become adults, my wife must file a complete, itemized, written account of everything she has done with our children's money. D, when our son and daughter become age 18, they can do whatever they please with their share of the estate. E, no one, including my wife, shall have the right to question how our children spend their shares. Three, if my wife does not survive me or dies while any of our children are minors, I do not nominate a guardian or conservator of our children, but hope relatives and friends may mutually agree on one, and if they cannot agree, the probate court can appoint any guardian or conservator it likes, including a stranger. Four, I do not appoint any executor of my estate and hope the probate court appoints someone I would approve. Five, if my wife remarries, the next husband, A, shall receive one-third of all my wife's property. B, need not spend any of his share on our three children, even if they need support. And C, can give his share to anyone he chooses without giving a penny to any of our children. Six, I do not care to learn whether there are ways to lower my death taxes and know it as much as possible will go to the government instead of my wife and children. In witness whereof, I have completely failed to make a different will of my own choice with the advice of my attorney because I really did not care to go through all that bother and I adopt this by default as my will. No signature required, John Doe. That's what will happen if you don't have a will. So let's say you have a will. Then you gotta ask yourself this question. Is it still good? Is the will I made five years ago, 10 years ago, still good? Ask yourself, since I made that will, have any of the following events occurred such that I need to do what? There's that word again we talked about earlier. Make a codicil, a change to my will. Have I remarried? Have I married or remarried? Have I divorced? Have any children been born or adopted? Are my children all grown up? Am I now a grandparent? Have my assets ri risen significantly in value? Have I received any additional assets that I didn't have when I made my will? Do, you know, do I no longer own certain assets that I listed in my will? Have certain beneficiaries that I named in my will died? Or have their needs changed? The individuals that I named as executor, trustee, guardian, conservator, have they died or moved away? Or are they no longer interested or available in being the executor, conservator, or guardian? Have I moved to another state? Have I lived in a state that was co a community property state? Has the federal government, Congress, or the state of Georgia passed any laws that now changed my will, changed the effect of my will from when I first made it. If any of these have occurred, you need to do a codicil, a change to your will. So uh, in, in other words, you need to review your will periodically, and I would say at least annually, to make sure that it's still accurate, it still uh, addresses what you want to address, and it, it uh, basically you know, conform to your current situation in case you've got grandkids now that you want to look out for. Any changes, like I've mentioned, you know, when they occur, you need to, you know, think about making changes to your will. And, of course, your will should be kept uh, just like that advance directive in a safe place, you know, where people can get to it. You don't want to hide it. You know, you put it in a safe deposit box, put it in a lock box, wherever you deem it safe, but you don't want to hide it because it needs to be found, you know, when you, when, when you die so that it can be uh, probated uh, like it's supposed to.
Now, uh, finally, we're going to trans transition to issues that, that I see uh, happen all the time with respect to automobile insurance. And I want to try to give you a better understanding of, of your automobile insurance and your needs and what you need to be looking out for uh, when you get that insurance. And, and even looking at it now, and especially what happens if you have the misfortune of being involved in an automobile accident. And I want to start off by showing you uh, what we call declaration pages from policies. And I'm, I'm going to first show you a, a policy uh, that's a GEICO policy. You see we got the names all, all blocked out. Now, under this GEICO policy, just to make sure you understand the coverage, if you look down at the bottom, it says bodily injury liability. Each person, each occurrence. And then to the right, it has the limits. And it's 25,000 slash 50,000. We simply call that 2550. Now, bodily injury liability means this is what your insurance company will pay somebody else if you cause the accident. If you run into me, cause injury to me, then the most your company will pay to me will be $25,000. If there's somebody in the car with me who's also injured, then they may have a claim too, but the most your insurance company will pay in total will be $50,000. So the most any one person can get to be 25, the most to be paid, no matter how many people, would be 50. And then there's the property damage. To fix my car or to pay for my car, the, lot, the, the maximum is going to be $25,000. Now, this is the minimum required by Georgia law. So you can imagine that if you cause an accident and somebody's driving a $50,000 Mercedes and it gets totaled, all your insurance company is going to be paying is twenty five. dollars So that can leave you in a, a tight situation depending on whether or not that person has uh, what we call uninsured motorist coverage, and we'll, we'll deal with that in a little bit. And you'll see here um, it has uninsured motorist coverage, uh, bodily injury, add-on, and it says $25,050. Again, the same limits as the bodily injury liability. And let me say this. Uninsured motorist is one of the most important coverages you can have, and I recommend everybody. If you don't have it, you need to get it, and it's not that expensive to add it to your policy. And here's what it does. If you're involved in an accident and someone hits you and they don't have any insurance or not enough insurance to cover your damages, then you can go under your own policy, this GEICO policy, and get and there's coverage of $25,000 uninsured. Now, I want to show you some differences. Let's flip to the next one. That's, a, that's the traveler's policy. And I want to show you some differences here. All right, this traveler's policy, if you look down at the bottom, comparing it to the GEICO policy we just looked at, this person has 50000 in liability coverage, 50100 So if they cause a wreck, the most that will get paid would be 50000 to one person and 100000 total. But they also have medical payments coverage. The person on the GEICO policy didn't have that. Let me tell you how that works. Medical payments coverage will cover you regardless of if it's your fault or the other person's fault. So let's say you're involved in an accident and it's caused by someone else and you're injured and you've got medical payments coverage of $10,000. Your insurance company will pay $10,000 of your medical bill. They will pay that. And that's important because, you know, I hear a lot of times people are in accidents and they're injured and they go to the hospital or the doctor and they want to give them the name of the other person's insurance company. Well, that other person's insurance company is not going to pay your medical bills as you're going to the doctor. They don't do that. You can't make them do that. When you see the doctor, the doctor's going to want to be getting paid right then or have some insurance that's going to pay them right then. So if you've got medical coverage, 
this is what you want to do. You want to file that with your insurance company. It's not going to put you at any fault or raise your premiums, and they will pay your medical bills up to that limit. And certainly, if you don't have this coverage, you need to have some health insurance that can cover you, too. The good thing about having the medical coverage on your car, though, is if you've got health insurance, let's say at work, all of them have a provision in there that says if, you're in, if, if your injuries that we are paying these bills for are caused by a third party and you get paid by a third party, classic example being car wreck, you get hit, you get injured, you wind up getting paid, getting a settlement or whatever, then your health insurance will want to be reimbursed for what they have paid for your medical expenses. So you, have to, you may have to reimburse them unless some other kind of complicated is issues come into play that we really don't need to get in today. But you may have to reimburse them. But if you got medical payments coverage on your car, they can't get reimbursed. They just simply have to pay. So that's another good thing about that and a difference. Now, also in looking at this traveler's policy, you can see down here under D1 that they've got uninsured motorist coverage too. But look at the difference. They've got what's called reduced coverage of 50100 whereas the GEICO policy have what we call add-ons. And let me tell you the difference, and I suggest everybody get add-on. Let me tell you the difference. As I said earlier, uninsured motorist covers you if the person that hits you does, does not have any insurance or doesn't have enough. Let's say that, and we knock on wood that this does not happen to any of you, but let's say that you've been involved in a serious injury and let's say you've got a broken arm and a broken leg. And just we just pull a number out of that. Let's say, let's say your claim, you come to me and I tell you, and, and we say, your case is, is worth at least $200,000, okay? Let's say the person that hits you had this, um, let's say they got this traveler's policy. Well, they got $50,000 um, worth of bodily injury uh, claim uh, insurance, and that, that's it, okay? Let's say they got $50,000, or they could have no insurance. Then... If they've got the $50,000, then all you can get from them, from their traveler's policy, would be $50,000. But your claim, as we say hypothetically, is worth $200,000. So that's a $150,000 gap. Well, let's say you've got this add-on uninsured motorist coverage. Let's say you've got add-on uninsured motorist coverage of $100,000. It does exactly what it says. It what it says. You add it on top of what you get from the Geico policy. So you can go under the Geico policy or the Travelers, I think, and get the fifty thousand dollars from the person that caused the injury. Then you can go under your uninsured motorist coverage and add on top of that one hundred. So you can get one hundred and fifty in that situation. Still not two hundred, but you can get one hundred and fifty. Now let's say you got reduced coverage, okay? Let's say it's reduced coverage, and I'm going to change the scenario a little bit. Let's say the person only had $25,000 in uninsured motor, in, in liability coverage, like the GEICO policy, and let's say you only have $25,000 uninsured motorist coverage, like the GEICO policy, and it's reduced. Well, in that instance, it's basically an, an, an issue of subtraction. If it's the same as the person has, you basically can't get anything. They offset. If they got 25000 in liability coverage and you've got 25000 in reduced uninsured motorist coverage, 25 from 25 is zero. So even if GEICO paid you the whole 25, you could not go under your policy to get anything. But let's say you had add-ons. You could get that 25, then go under your policy and add on top of theirs. So add on means you can go under your policy and add on top of what the person has, but reduced coverage means that you basically have to subtract what you have from what they have. I hope everybody understands that. If not, 
We can cover that some more in the uh, questions. I really recommend the uninsured uh, motorist coverage. I also recommend that you have what we call gap insurance. And I see this a lot of times. A lot of times people are hurt in accidents, but they're more concerned about their car. You know, my car is not paid off. And a lot of people think that when the car is damaged, what they're supposed to be paid is what they owe on it. The law says what you're supposed to be paid is what it's worth, the fair market value. So let's say you've got a car that you've got a 2018 Honda, and you're still paying on it, and you owe $10,000, let's say, but it's only, it's only worth 5000 I know these numbers may not make sense, but this, this is just for example. Well, you're what we call upside down. You owe more than it's worth. But if you got gap insurance, it makes up the difference. Again, it does what it says. It's ma it makes up the gap or closes the gap. So if you don't, if your car is not worth enough to pay it off, if you got gap insurance, you can file under that, and it makes up the difference so that you don't be stuck where now you're paying for a car that you no longer can drive, and you got to wind up getting a new car. So. We transition and we talk about what happens if you have an accident, unfortunately. One thing you do, you need to notify your insurance company because they have requirements for you to do that. And if you don't do that, they can somehow use that sometimes, uh, you know, not to cover a claim to the extent that, uh, that they should. If you're injured, you need to contact an attorney. An attorney is experienced, uh, you know, to handle that if they do personal injury work. You don't need to try to do it yourself because there are several pitfalls that you can fall into. For example, personal injury claims have what we call a statute of limitations. If you don't file it, don't, that's a lawsuit within two years from the date of injury, or the case is not settled within two years from the date of injury, then it's gone, no matter how you work, how, um, how injured or hurt you were. And I've seen people who have tried to deal with insurance companies themselves, and the insurance company strings them out for right up to the statute of limitations, and then they try to call a lawyer, and it's just not enough time to do anything. So you're better off getting someone who has the expertise to handle it. The other pitfall I've seen and want to tell you about so that you don't do this yourself is anytime you resolve a claim with an insurance company, they send you what we call a release. And a release is a document that says, I'm accepting this money that you're paying me, but I'm giving up any and all claims that I have against you. And there are two types. There's a general release, and there's a general release, and what we call a limited liability release. A general release releases everybody, the world. A limited liability release only releases the person who caused the injury and their insurance company and nobody else. And the reason that's important is going back to the example I gave you of the uninsured motorist claim. Let's say you... Again, we'll go back to that GEICO policy. You got a bad injury. GEICO has $25,000 uh, to pay you for your injury, and they agree to pay you that. And you say, oh, I remember, I got that add-on uninsured motorist coverage now of $100,000, so now I'm going to go to my company to get that $100,000. Well, if you sign a general release with GEICO, you'll be in trouble because when you go to your company and say, I've got this bad injury, my case is worth a lot more, they agree that it is, and, they say, and, and you say, I want to make a claim under my uninsured motorist uh, add-on policy, and they said, okay, fine. Have you received all of the insurance proceeds from GEICO? You say, oh, yeah, no problem. They paid me 25000 They asked, well, have you signed a release? Yeah, can you send us a copy? You send them that release, and it's a general release, it would have released them too, so you could not get a dime from your company. But if you had signed what we would put together for you as a limited liability release, you would only have released GEICO and their insured for causing your injury, but not your uninsured motorist company, and you could still go under them. So you don't need to try to do this yourself. Again, I know I've covered a lot of information. We're going to have some time to... Uh, to ask some questions, and I hope I can give you some answers. 
I've really enjoyed doing this. Anyone has any questions at any time outside of today, feel free to reach me at, at, uh, at my law firm. Again, I want to thank Beulah Land, and thank you uh, for having me and for your attention today. Thank you very much.